the rocks have been rolling around inside the Lake Superior surf for over 10,000 years. Billions of them worn away into colorful pebbles over a meter deep for as far as the eye can see. They create a loud, sweeping, shooshing sound with each wave breaking onto the shore. Gusting winds swirl along the tree line and whisper through the pines. A cacophony of sounds that sometimes screams in anger and other times it creates a gentle song. Kichigumi has a never-ending playlist and it can never be muted. The song and dance repeats over and over and it will endure far beyond the innovations of man and those who live and work along its shores. But I think that the men knew, when they saw the diesel engine, that that was the end of Jackfish. Nobody said anything, but I know it was in their hearts, in their minds. Because that was the reason for Jackfish being, because it was a coal and watering place with their steam engines. As soon as the train could run through, it really wasn't needed anymore. So it stuck around for a while, it became a sort of a maintenance hub, you know, they used to have section workers and people who would work on the tracks and then in the 60s eventually they moved and pretty soon it was a ghost town, abandoned, and there was nothing left. This track is, uh, is uh, pretty busy, it's the main line, so we really have to pay attention to trains that might be coming, and uh, I try to uh, take care of people I bring in here because uh, these things can sneak up on you very quickly, so we'll have to be careful. But uh, it's a nice walk, so uh, we'll see you later. In 1871, Canada was only four years old. The population was under four million people, and it decided to build the world's longest railroad, thus altering the shape of a nation forever. Well before the steam locomotives belch smoke and ashes along the coastline of Jackfish Bay on Lake Superior, there stood only a tiny fishing village. There were three Scandinavian families who enjoyed the same tranquility as the First Peoples. The location was barely anything more than a minor stopover for fur traders. Commercial fishing thrived 
with bountiful catches of whitefish and hundreds of feet of strained nets with squirming lake trout, each averaging 10 pounds or more. Ben Almos, one of the early immigrants would have considered the rugged northern Lake Superior coastline very similar to his homeland, Norway. The bay was very deep and the village was protected from violent storms by shoals and islands, the largest being St. Patrick Island a short distance offshore. But in the early 1870s something was stirring on the coast and in the forests that in a few short years would shake the North Shore tranquility into oblivion. Engineers and surveyors of the Transcontinental Railway Project saw Jackfish Bay as an ideal natural harbor that could accommodate large steamships laden with railroad supplies and most important, massive quantities of coal necessary to operate steam locomotives. Designs were drawn up to complete 650 miles of track through the wilderness of northern Ontario. The Lake Superior route from Marathon to Thunder Bay was 200 miles of the most treacherous and expensive sections of railroad anywhere in Canada. And Jackfish Bay was close to the centre of it all. The dangerous, heavy construction along and through Lake Superior's mountainous, rock-armoured coastline caused a great deal of concern and opposition politically, publicly and among major investors. The transcontinental link in Northern Ontario was described as uninhabitable wilderness across the Canadian Shield. Up there, this was like, it was continuous rock from that side to that side. This was all, this was all rock. So they had to blast out all out to get, basically that's what it is. You know, you can see that this was all connected, but they have to have a flat bed. They couldn't put it over the top and down because you'd be up and down like a roller coaster. Now there's a notation on one of these rocks nearby here, and I'll show it to you of a sailor or someone who came out on the rocks probably when the boat was being unloaded a hundred years ago and wrote his name on the rocks here. Here we are, a couple of uh, old, old names. This is C.H. Uh, Webb, it looks like. S.S. Glen Sheen. And the date looks to be June 13th, 1915. And here's another one here from the Glen Sheen too, it must have been out the same day. This is M, or L. McPenetang, I think it says there, Ontario. SS Glen Sheen. You can imagine the blasting and digging and blowing up of this rock to get this track through here. This was some of the most difficult track to put in on the CPR line <clears throat> along the North Shore. It just was really, really difficult to get through all this stuff and uh, yeah, stuff of legends. The government was lobbied from all directions for a more feasible route, in particular, to link up with railways in the United States. Chicago was already established as the major transportation hub in the interior of North America. It was argued that it would be far more efficient to ship goods without interruption from southwestern Ontario by steamship along Lakes Huron, Superior and Michigan to Chicago and disperse goods westward across the continent. Lobbyists also argued for Canada to build a railway route across southern Michigan and then re-enter Canada in the province of Manitoba. It would have been a fraction of the cost compared to building and maintaining an all-Canadian route through northern Ontario, in particular along Lake Superior. Canada as a nation was still in its infancy and needed to strengthen its national identity. There was a threat that British Columbia would join the United States if there was no link with the rest of Canada through the Rocky Mountains. 
It was also imperative to have an all-Canadian route for all sorts of national security reasons. The Prime Minister approved the All-Canadian Transcontinental Railway. In 1881, the Canadian Pacific Railway Act received royal assent and shortly thereafter, a contract signed with the Canadian Pacific Railway Company with the caveat that the entire transcontinental railway be completed in 10 years. It was completed in just four. So I got to tell you, somewhere in here, I'm not sure where on this face, but somewhere along here one day, many years ago, I decided I would, uh, it looks like I could climb up there really easy. Actually here, I fancy myself a bit of a mountain climber, I guess, you know, I really like to go on the rock, and I still do kind of in a way, but, so off I went. Somewhere along here somewhere, I'm not sure where exactly. But I got about halfway up. I got quite a bit off the ground. It was a hot summer day. Sun was beating down on me. I got to a point where I couldn't go up and I couldn't come down. I was all by myself, no protection whatsoever, no ropes, nothing. And the reason I couldn't come down is that I was reaching for a, a foothold and I couldn't find it. Reaching, 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 and I'm thinking, why am I doing this? Like, how did I ever get myself into this predicament, you know? Train came by even. <laughs> you know, and I'm up there. Finally, after being stuck for about 20 minutes, I thought, I've got to get down. I can't go up any higher. There was too much of an overhang or something. I couldn't do it. So I just gave a big, long stretch, and my foot hit what I was looking for. I came down. I got to the bottom. I swore I would never do it again. And I didn't until about a year later. Taking over the general manager role for the Canadian Pacific Railway in 1881 was Sir William Cornelius Van Horn. He was considered a genius in managing railway construction operations. Van Horn, it is said, worked harder than his crews. His skills and determination along the north shore of Lake Superior's mountainous granite was responsible for the rapid completion of the main line. He coordinated many major logistical operations, such as contracting steamships to distribute materials and supplies, opening stone quarries, and opening three dynamite factories between Jackfish and the Coldwell Fishing Village 20 miles to the east. Each factory produced over a ton of explosives per day at a cost of $7.5 million to blast through the Ontario granite. Van Horn described the area from Jackfish to Nipigon an area of engineering impossibilities. One of the early construction camps and dock was established at Naslo about two and a half miles west around the long sweeping Jackfish Curve from where the village of Jackfish would later be built. Pierre Burton in his historical chronicle, The Last Spike, gives a snapshot of railway construction. A swath 66 feet wide would be chopped out of bushland and forest. Tunnels would be drilled and galleries notched into the sides of cliffs. Bridges of various designs would be flung across coulees and river valleys. Cuts would be blasted out of rock and the broken debris thus obtained would be borrowed to fill in the intervening gorges and declines so that the grade might be as level as possible. So this is from Buffalo, New York, USA, July 14th, 1917. So 102 years ago. Just amazing. So 102 years ago. You know, I probably went down to the stores and the ships, you know, got a bucket of paint and a paintbrush and came up here and little did this person know that 102 years later, somebody will be taking a video of it. Buffalo, New York. These sailors came from all over.
In those early years of construction, the hardships would be compounded by horrendous living conditions. Men crammed into low-walled bunkhouses 60 feet long and 30 feet wide stacked with bunk beds and a single wood-burning stove in the center. Damp clothes hung everywhere. Some men washed, others didn't. The air was thick with stench and the roofs often leaked. The winters were bone-chilling, reaching 30 degrees below zero Fahrenheit for weeks on end. The summers were unbearably hot. Clouds of mosquitoes and black flies would frenzy feed on any open skin and eventually crawl their way under clothing. Black flies were especially vicious, described as biting out a chunk of human flesh, flying away with it and eating it on a rock. The only relief was the Lake Superior breeze or a dip in the icy cold water if you were lucky enough to be anywhere near the shoreline. Officially on May 16, 1885, at mile marker 102.7, at the Noslo siding about a mile west of the Jackfish Tunnel, the last spike was hammered into the tie by Colonel Oswald of the Montreal Light Infantry along with his troops traveling on the first eastbound train. Today, there is no trace of the work camp and pier at Noslo. There is no road access or trail to the location of Ontario's historic last spike. The only thing marking the event was the stone cairn built 50 years later in 1935. Aside from train crews passing by, there are only scatterings of visitors that dare walk miles along the track or arrive by boat. Ontario's last spike was left stranded when Jackfish was abandoned. The village of Jackfish and Deepwater Port was developed in 1895. My parents were married here and, you know, I kind of had my start here and uh, I had this great affection for this place, you know, I, I, even though there's not much left, I, you know, and there's really nothing on my property, but I keep coming back because it's part of me. Uh, I suggested once to my children that I would like to sell my property. Well, they didn't, they wouldn't hear of it, you know, because it's part of their legacy too, they feel. So, you know, I will keep on, keep it in the family. Um, a lot of these properties are leased from the CPR, but this property I do, I, I bought outright, so, uh, you know, I just like getting here. I come down, I cut the grass, I make a fire in the fire pit, and I sit and mull, and sometimes my wife will come with me and she'll search for bottles and cans, and uh, you know, every house here had their own dump, so it, you go out and you dig up things, you'll get some beautiful bottles, and you know, uh, things that people like to collect. I, uh, I find a great peace down here, you know, like Pebble Beach, and the ever-changing dynamics of the lake, it changes from day to day. One day it's calm, one day it's rough, and uh, blue sky, rainy sky, you know, cloud, and thunder, and it just mirrors human nature, really. It's, uh, it's the way it is. I just uh, I always find great peace coming here. Steam locomotives had to be fed an enormous amount of coal and could only travel short distances relative to today's diesels without having to refill their tenders and boilers. A 145 mile trip from Thunder Bay to Jackfish would burn 15 tons of coal with an average of five to six shovelfuls every two minutes in order to maintain pressure in the boiler. Jackfish was situated perfectly to receive, disperse, and stockpile massive amounts of coal. A 600-foot dock was built to accept lake freighters from Pennsylvania and Ohio, with 5,000 gross tons or more in their cargo holds. In the early years, the coal was hand-shoveled into buckets and raised and lowered with winches, it would take an army of men three days to empty the ship. 
As time went on, a coal dock plant was built and two large cranes with clams. The cranes hoisted up coal and dumped it into small hopper cars with a capacity of three tons. The trestle dock was equipped with a two-directional chain conveyor system that ran an eighth of a mile beyond the dock over top of a siding where regular gondola cars were waiting below. The coal was gravity dumped and trains transported the coal to depots in White River and Scriber. During peak times, there were up to 300 men working on and around the coal dock facilities. In the freeze-up months, only 15 men remained, with many others traveling to fruit farms in the southern United States. Coal was stockpiled for winter operations through the shipping season to a large cleared area two miles east of Jackfish called New Yards. Today, it is known as the Santoy Siding. In 1914, during the war years, and again during World War II, it was expanded to hold 600,000 tons of coal in 35-foot high piles. The stockpile was so large, there was a constant fear of fire from lightning strikes or other combustion. The pile would be impossible to extinguish and could burn for days. The CPR provided lignite coal for personal heating at $6 a ton. Residents called the coal lugnite because people bought the first ton of coal and then each lugged by night another three to four tons in sacks from the coal pile. Coal was an important commodity for survival, in particular in isolated towns. Darren Rowland, originally from Scriber, shared a story about his grandfather, who worked for the CPR during the Depression years. While driving the train through Jackfish, he would throw lumps of coal to waiting residents along the track as his train drove by. Now right down here is that abandoned car. You can see it down here in the woods. How it ever got here, I don't know, but uh, there she sits. On the eastern edge of Jackfish, resting on the forest floor, with no sign of a roadway or driveway, we come upon a 1946 Dodge Custom four-door sedan. I don't know the history of this car, but uh, there she is. It's been kind of cannibalized over the years, but uh, it's an old Dodge. All it really needs is a little buffing out and it'll be fine, you know? Bring back up the shine and there's the old block still sitting there. Good flat. It had a six-cylinder flathead engine that produced 102 horsepower. The post-war design was similar to the 1942 model, due to Chrysler having to focus on the war effort. The original cost was $1,389, and today's value, in Concourse 1 condition, would be $24,900. You just wonder what the story behind this car, though, is, you know? And here it is, like, 60, 70 years later, whatever the time frame is, and just sitting here getting the odd visitor just like us. The old Dodge, abandoned, picked over by thieves, vandals, souvenir hunters, will always remain a ghostly relic consumed by the forest. The coal chute capacity was 400 tons. It was built in 1921 and only operated for a few decades before it was dynamited and left a heap of rubble. Yeah, this straddled the tracks at one time and uh, it was full of coal and the train would stop underneath the coal chute and receive another load of coal to make the run to Thunder Bay, put Arthur Fort William at the time. and. Uh, I guess the CPR felt that it was uh, a hazard, so uh, it was pushed over into the woods like this. I'm not sure if it was imploded or what, uh, how they got her down, but uh, I remember coming in one summer and there it was in the ditch, and it's been like that now for a long time. I remember climbing up that thing once, because it had uh, stairs on the outside and the stairs were accessible, so up I went, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, right to the top, and what a view. 
size is. It's huge. Yeah. It held a lot of coal. Full of rebar, yeah. so still as solid as the day it was. Built. Concrete hasn't de de you know, deteriorated whatsoever, hardly. This is a day of steam, of course, you know, when they needed coal to power the boilers. So the coal that was brought in by Lakers eventually wound up in here. And then once it was in here, it wound up in, tra in the train hoppers. So that was the progression. And once it was in the train's hoppers, it wound up in the train's furnace to heat the water to make the steam to drive the, the, the wheels. Yeah, it's easy to get into. Yeah. Have a look at that. Oh, my. I often thought I'd like to buy this from CP for a dollar or so and turn into a summer camp. The water tower was once a landmark in Jackfish. Giant pumps pushed the water from Lake Superior to high above the town, where it fed the railroad by gravity. All that remains today is its thick concrete foundation. But this held... Oh, man, it's like a bunker. I know, it's amazing, eh? You think they overbuilt things in those days? You think? <laughs> but you can see the infrastructure, you know, like obviously that was down to groundwater or something, you know, and, or it would be pumped up into the, uh, maybe right from the lake. And then they would just gravity feed right into the, I don't know what it was above, like, they must have had giant tanks up there. This is just the foundation. But you know, all the way around, there's like a walkway all the way around the outside. So it's just very castle-like, you know? Yeah. It's like uh, something from the medieval evil ages, you know, like. Jackfish was full of life between 1900 and 1940. Hundreds of workers arrived and in due course, they built homes and brought their families. The age of motor vehicles was only in its infancy and even as time passed, few people had cars as there were no roads and virtually nowhere to go. The train was the lifeline for everything the town needed to thrive and survive. Jackfish built a church, cabins, a school and boarding houses. The town was complemented with a famous landmark, the Lakeview Hotel. There was an outdoor hockey rink and a grocery store. Clem Downey sitting here outside the store eloquently reminisced about life in Jackfish and the history of Jackfish published by Jane Poole in 1976. In the small village of Jackfish, as simple, people had to make their own fun. Children during recess would form their own teams of ball and tag or steal the hat. The boys would go with me or their parents and hunted, fished and snared rabbits. In the winter, there was always snow to shovel from the rink before they could play hockey. Jackfish had its own regional hockey team. Almost every boy played an instrument. There was a little orchestra of one violin, three guitars, a banjo, and along with a small choir, the teacher on piano. They performed for 15 minutes on Thunder Bay Radio the Little Red Schoolhouse had 40 to 45 pupils, all in one room. It had social events, box socials, bingos, town meetings, and Christmas concerts. When coal boats came in during the summer months, it became customary for the crew to be allowed off the ship, and a dance was put on in the hall. 
almost every woman in Jackfish would attend and provide the dancing partners. Clem could not recall if the dances ever got out of hand. He said most of the skippers and mates had been coming into Jackfish for years and were old friends. Jackfish had a conservation club and held an annual fish derby. In 57, the first prize was a radio and of course, in the evening, there was the derby dance held at the school hall. There was a general store and after the station closed, it kind of took over as the mail depot. You know, if you wanted to mail a letter, you would drop it off there. And there was a time, I think, when the trains would stop here and pick up the mail and uh, drop off the mail, because Jackfish was still a, a railroad town, basically. And then one day they announced that they were going to have automatic mail catchers on the trains. So the idea was you would take the mail bag and there was like a big C-clamp and you would stretch the mail bag between these, the upper and lower part, so the bag would be like this. And so the train would come thundering along and in the mail car of the train, this thing would come down like this. And the idea was as it came up to the C-clamp, it would snag the bag and they would just lever it back into the train car. So anyway, the very first time this happened, the town came out to watch. And we're all gathered around down here. I was quite small, obviously, I was very young. But I remember it. As the train came along, we were waiting in great anticipation for this event, you know. So the train comes along and sure enough, down comes the catcher. And I don't know what happened, but he missed the bag. He hit the bag and the bag went cartwheeling off into the bushes and we were all devastated that it didn't work. We came back the next night to watch it again. Well, they got it right this time. It worked. Grabbed the bag, they added the bag in the catcher and we flipped it back into the mail car. So the train didn't even have to stop anymore. It just went thundering right through. There was still something. But yeah, the corner store was here. The dock went out sort of past that dead tree and out quite far, then hooked to the left. And then out this way, was the big long coal dock where the ships used to moor. So those two docks sort of came together, but there was a big enough gap between them that you could get a, you know, it was, well, it was substantial. It was probably a hundred feet or more. There used to be like boat houses and uh, a whole mess of buildings down in this flat area below the tracks between obviously before the water. All, all gone. Very hard to find remains and ruins and foundations anymore. Small homes were scattered throughout the rough, rocky village. No streets, no lights, no motor cars. There was little more than a rough, hand-cut dirt road built in the latter years. This is probably one of the most visited buildings in town. And uh, do you remember last night I pointed out this Falzetta person? You know, this little this fella? Uh, he used to live here, and I'm not sure how many of his family members did. But I remember seeing him, you know, he uh, used to come down the track sometimes with a great big pail full of blueberries. Because as you were driving in, there was a lot of blueberry picking up in that area. And I think he would go out and pick all day. But he would fill a pail, a water pail full of blueberries. It was amazing to see. And I think what happened here, as you'll see, we'll go through the building. And this is the building I told you about where to get to the next room, it was like added on. And then the room was added on after that one, and then that one. And each room got smaller. But to get to the next room, you had to walk through the room previously. There were no hallways. It was just one room into the other room. So I would love to have seen the actual dynamic of that family in the day, because if you wanted to get to your bedroom, which is way at the other end, you had to go through all these other rooms to get to it. No hallways, just other rooms. But um, this building, for some reason or other, escaped the fire that went through Jackfish about 10 years ago. and. Uh, it's still intact, but Jack which used to be full of these places, which made it much more interesting. But now, there are just a couple. This is one of them. I mean, there are some private properties here, but as far as old, original buildings from Jackfish, this is one of the last ones that still stands, but we can go over and have a look at it. But Jackfish still is interesting to a lot of people. 
even though there isn't much here, people still come in to see it, to see the old ghost town, the old relics of towns. You can see these monks' hoods. These were probably planted 60, 70 years ago and they continue to grow. And no one tends to them, but every year they come up. Yeah, this is another little cabin. This is not attached to this one, but this is the one that's interesting, but there's another one. I vaguely remember the family that lived in here. This was the Falzetta family. You can see that this house right here was singed by the fire. So how it never caught itself and burned, I, I'll, I'll never know. But this whole wall is blackened by flame and heat, and, but it's still standing. I would say this was probably the former kitchen area. This looks like the fireplace where the wood stove would be attached to. But as you can see, this is what I was saying about, you know, moving from one room to the next room, but having to go right through the middle of the room. The unfortunate thing is I just noticed, and I haven't been in here in a while, this, this roof, this, the, this particular ceiling collapsed, so it's going to prevent getting to the back rooms here, but you can see there is a doorway back here. And there are at least two more rooms after this one, but uh, it's impossible to get in there now. That's the last room, but it, you can't get to it because this has collapsed. The roof has come down. You can smell the years of abandonment, but from time to time, you cannot help but imagine what day-to-day -day life was like. Peeking into the kitchen window, you can almost smell a blueberry pie cooling on the sill. Yep. The Lakeview Hotel was built in the early 1900s by the owner and operator, Mr. Bill Frazier. He was described as a real character with a loud, booming voice. He brought in one of the first cars in Jackfish, a 1933 Jitney. In the beginning, one woman recalled the hotel as being terribly posh. It was thought to be too elaborate for the village. The interior was beautifully decorated with thick carpets. The restaurant served delicious meals. Frida Heinrich recalled being a waitress at 14 years old in the 50s. People were especially nice. It was a wonderful and exciting time. The best job ever. The Lakeview was licensed, other than in the Prohibition years, 1918 to 1920. It was a hotspot for seasonal workers for six to eight months of the year that boosted the jackfish population and the economy. The original hotel was two separate buildings, one housing the bedrooms and the restaurant, and the other had a pool hall. Rumor had it the upstairs was a gambling den for stud and draw poker. The first bar held 45 people. In the 1940s, Mr. Gino Spadoni of Scriber bought the hotel. He joined the buildings and enlarged the bar to hold 100 people. Mr. Spadoni introduced running water, electricity, and indoor toilets. The bartenders were colorful characters. Jack Yates recalled that many a time when acting as a bartender and bouncer, he was himself bounced right out of the place. 
through glass windows, over the porch banister, and onto the front yard of the hotel. Before the mid-1930s, most social events were held in the pool room of the hotel, or in the cookery. Crawley McCracken would provide sausage and bean suppers for dances in the 1920s. The Lakeview Hotel was considered an historic landmark, and in a flash, it disappeared. It burned to the ground on an early Sunday morning in 1960. The manager and his wife, Mr. and Mrs. Percy McCluskey, escaped just in time with only their night attire. There were no registered guests at the time. The fire was so intense, the glow was visible in Scriber 23 miles away. It was a favorite spot for locals, workers, steamship crews, and tourists. It had the old-style open liquor bar and many antique features, which gave it the old-timey charm. Some of the group of seven artists made it their home while painting in the Jackfish area. It was a long veranda, so there, but there was one big main flight of stairs that went right up to the center of the hotel. Yeah, it pretty much burned right to the ground and then uh, I have a couple of chunks of glass at home from the fire. The, the, the heat was so intense that it just fused everything, melted bottles into, you know, globs of glass. Lyle brings us to his property at the west end of Jackfish. Devastated by time, severe winters, vandals, and a forest fire, the only thing that survives are a small piece of the front yard, the front steps to the camp, and a stone fireplace and chimney. So anyway, that house I showed you, that cabin, with the open lawn right to the tracks, this was there, you can see the floor is still there. And this was what it was. And these bed frames here, when we took over the cabin and turned it into a living place for a couple of summers, those are our old beds, still there. There's like a, like a couch there, couch springs. But the sad part of the whole thing is that you can see that and that and that birch. We're all vibrant, flourishing, older birches but the fire killed them. It is a small oasis that stimulates cherished memories of a life and place, reclaimed by Lake Superior and the forests on her shores. The Jackfish train station during and after the construction years was initially established as a train order station, controlling by telegraph the movement of trains with information received from the train dispatcher. It is a charming design, not too unlike many railroad stations across the country. It was one of the focal points for the town, located near the coal docks 
and adjacent to the Lakeview Hotel. Everything depended on the railroad to import and export all the essentials of life and commerce. For hundreds, if not thousands of people over the years, the platform at the train station was of fond reunions and sad departures. One of the first fatal blows to the future of Jackfish was in the early 1940s when the Trans-Canada Highway planned to bypass the village. During the Second World War, Canadians of Japanese ancestry were forcibly evacuated from British Columbia and housed in four work camps between Scriber and Jackfish. It was a horrific chapter in Canada's history. Isolated from family and community, the men suffered from poor morale as the months dragged on into years of exile until the highway was built. The final blow. And it probably was right about here, in this area somewhere, there was a siding here at one point. And this is where, in the 50s, when the first diesel was coming along, that there was a diesel unit parked here on the siding. And I remember coming down here with my father to look at the diesel engine with all the other men of the village. And we're all milling about looking at this big diesel engine and I thought it was the most amazing thing I'd ever seen. But I think that the men knew when they saw the diesel engine that that was the end of Jackfish. Nobody said anything but I know it was in their hearts, in their minds. Clem Downey wrote an epilogue in his Reflections of Jackfish. There would no longer be a need for the coal. Within a few years, the coal dock was abandoned. No longer did those huge boats come into Jackfish, and the exodus had begun. The population dwindled and moved to other towns and other occupations. Slowly, the village became a deserted settlement, the hotel burned, the station was torn down, the school abandoned and went to ruin. If you look out of the train window now as you pass, you see only cement stumps of the plant and the buildings. The rest is devastation. A single house or two is the only reminder of a once prosperous village. It took only 75 years of history and Jackfish is much like it was before the construction crews began the railway along the northern coast of Lake Superior. The forest grows up and then it burns down And I am here in a ghost town Jack pine cones release their seeds To the embers on the ground Jackfish was a little town Before the people moved on out Hiding amidst 
Shore. 